Well, if you're visiting this morning, we're so humbled that you would be here. Thank you for your prayers and all the support. You know, I'm getting texts from all over, so I can't even imagine what Mark's phone is like. There's pastors like, can I drive up after church tomorrow? And he's like six hours away. I'm like, just keep praying. If there's, if there's a point where we need manpower, we'll call you, you know. Where we were. And so for now, just keep praying until we get to a certain point of clarity. But if you're visiting with us, I want to encourage you to think beyond just visiting a church. And for everybody else that's been here forever, I want to give you what I'm calling on your handout a stark reminder of our purpose. Because I want to convince you this morning that you being here is so much more important than just belonging to a community of believers. It's so much more important than just reaching out even to a community. It is so much more than even being a church for all people. You'll see as we go along that I really do believe that God is using us to potentially be an answer for the destruction of the inner cities of America. You'll see why in just a moment. I've chosen as this, as this morning a passage from Romans 12. And the reason I chose it was because Raphael Estrella, our director of finances, in that room last Wednesday shared it in our staff prayer. And it was such an awesome time in the word that as I kept praying, okay, God, what do we need to hear? How do we need to be reminded of our mission heading into fall? This passage just kept coming to mind. And even more importantly, it's application for today. And so if you're here and you're thinking, hey, this is just a great time to visit. This seems like a cool church. I'm here to tell you it takes a whole lot more than that to sustain walking here over a period of time. Just ask anybody that's been here a long time. This is not an easy or a comfortable church to be in. It just isn't. Part of the reason, you look around, you see everybody's different, everybody thinks different, and like Mark always says, that I always say, there's a 100% chance you're going to offend somebody or be offended at something or another just by rubbing elbows with so many so different than you. And those that have walked with us for a long time come to understand that this is really a calling more than anything else. And that that calling keeps us walking when we're offended and when things get hard and when they're not comfortable, when there are other places that you drive past that could offer you a whole lot more in terms of services, in terms of amenities. And what I'm here to say this morning is maybe God wants more than that out of you. And so let's begin by looking at Romans chapter 12 with a slight new application in today's volatile environment and the application of the church. Look at that way it begins. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Okay, now stop right there, because that, that's a mouthful right there, right? We could spend probably a month talking about that one verse. But notice what he says, I appeal to you, therefore. What's the therefore about? What are the mercies of God? It's what he's been spending all this time writing about, the grace of God. He's already been through the fact that where sin abounded, grace abounded all the more. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And all this wonderful theology about who Christ was and how nobody is deserving of his grace and that there's this war within us with our flesh, and that Christ is the only answer. And he's like, okay, so therefore I am begging you, brothers and sisters, by these mercies, this grace, this forgiveness, this new acceptance before God because of Christ's sacrifice, 
to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, you've probably heard 10,000 sermons on being a living sacrifice. But listen to this. Number one, we're to present ourselves. Okay, this means everything you are, everything you hope you've become, everything you were, you just lay it down. You present yourself and you say, okay, God, take it, okay? But present ourselves as what? A living sacrifice. Have you ever thought about how hard that is? A sacrifice is hard. It's never easy. It's never comfortable to be a sacrifice. It's never comfortable or easy to sacrifice on behalf of somebody else or on behalf of some other thing or behalf on a cause. Sacrifice is hard. It costs. It costs your pride. It costs your time. It costs your energy. It costs your money. It costs. And what Paul is saying is, therefore, brothers and sisters, because of everything Christ has done for you, and the mercies which God has poured on you, live like it means something. Live your life every day, every moment, as though it has been bought with something worth your sacrifice. Live your life at this perspective and this mindset that whatever you're going to do is not going to be for your own comfort, not going to be because it's the easy thing to do, it's because God has asked you to be this for his kingdom, for his glory, for his namesake. Now, look at what he says. If you do this, this is your spiritual what? Worship. This is so much greater than three songs on a Sunday, right? And remember James Wobber used to say, worship is a lifestyle. And this is what essentially he's saying, live your life every day, every single day, every moment of every day in such a way that people see that something is driving you that's beyond this world that they cannot explain but that they want to know more about and that your life is not mirroring what everybody else is doing. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Don't choose the easy, comfortable way. Choose what God has asked you to do, because you can bet this, and this is the question I've asked for years, would God ever ask us to do something he knows we could do? Would he ever ask us to do something that he knows is possible, humanly speaking? I'm convinced the answer is no. Why would he? It just confused the issue. If he asked you to do something he knew you could do already, well, then who gets the credit? He's going to ask you to do something he knows you cannot do for the purpose of you doing it and then going, oh, man, there's no way I could have ever done that. That was all him. It's the hardest thing I ever did. Wouldn't worst it on my worst enemy, but I'm so glad that he called me to it. That's a calling. And what God is asking us to do is to live our lives in this way and to think this way, to have a perspective of this way, and to not give up when times get hard. Okay, now how can we apply this? Well, you know, it's the most volatile, controversial issue of our day is everything that's happening around us. And look at what he says next, because this is where the application comes in. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And so when he says don't be conformed, that word conformed is a very, very interesting word, because it has its roots in the same word as hypocrite. Remember how I said that that means you put on a mask and you pretend you're somebody you're not? Well, conformed is being like a hypocrite, putting on this mask, but it's also acting 
in a prescribed way because everybody else is doing it. So you getting it? If you're conformed to the world, you're doing it because the world is doing it and who you are as you do it is really not really who you are because Christ is in you and he wants what you to do to be distinctly characteristic of what he did and how he would do it. And I bring up the race issue and everything happening and all that stuff in Charlottesville and even Hot Springs this last weekend because when I look at the world and the way that they respond. It's the world at work. We shouldn't be surprised. How does the world respond in those situations? Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You condemn everybody and everything. You repay evil for evil, revenge, any means necessary. And that's not what I see Christ doing. In fact, Paul's, this whole chapter basically is a way Paul says, look, this is really hard what we're doing. And there's stuff happening out there that's going to challenge what you do in here. But I'm about to tell you the way that you in here could, one more one, treat each other and respond to things out there. And they should be distinctly Christ-like. They should not follow the patterns of the world. Okay, and so what he says is, don't be conformed. Don't be set in your patterns by what everybody else is doing. But instead, transform your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And you know, if you, if you Google, Google church, condemnation, racism, whatever, you, you end up with like three million hits, and it's over and over and over and over. The church condemns this, and these evangelicals are condemning these people, and over and over and over. And it's, you know, there's no question that racism is evil. No question. It is pure self-righteousness mixed with unbridled arrogance and pride. I mean, that's all there is. Think that somehow you're better than somebody else and that you think therefore you deserve to master them, dominate them, exploit them, whatever, make them serve you so that you can be more comfortable. I mean, how antithetical to Christ is that? In my mind, that just shows us that man is born with a sin nature because every culture in every country, throughout every period of history, has had this issue. Always has and probably always will until the day Jesus comes back. And what Jesus is asking us to do is not just counteract it by our actions, but to inject it with who he is. Now, here's what's so funny. Racism has a lot of connotations to it, but so does condemnation. Condemnation assumes so much. It assumes that you somehow have been self-assigned to be the judge of another, and also assumes that you have the authority to declare that a person is unusable, not just now, but forevermore. That sounds like a very close relative to racism, if you ask me. Which is why I don't want us to play that game. That is not what Christ says. Why do I say this with so much passion? Because I have heard so many people behind this pulpit stand up and say, and such was I. Remember Harold Nash? He started the church, one of our original teaching pastors. Now he's the pastor of Fellowship North, one of my dearest friends in all the world. He stood right here last March. Remember what he said? I used to hate white people. 
And he listed a bunch of stuff. White people did them growing up. And you know what? By the world's standard, he deserved to hate every one of us based on the injustice that he did. Across the street, I remember one night, an older white gentleman said, I used to despise black people. And he talked about his involvement in some of the very groups that we can't stand. But God through Christ, transformed both of them through the renewing of their mind and coming to understand these people were actually now brothers and sisters. And such were some of us. You know, I've been talking to this young He's re he comes from a wealthy family, a young white uh, pastor in Nebraska. And he's always asking me, he's like, he calls me probably every week or so almost. And it's like, I really believe, and he's been talking to me so long, I can see there's really a sincere calling at play here. And, I'm, and I keep telling him, man, God can use you in this situation. We need pastors like you that are called. We need pastors that have wealth behind them involved in this movement. And, and I said, but you better be ready because this is not for the squeamish. And I want you to be ready for when in the midst of all of this calling, that somebody calls you a racist. You'll be in good company. I don't know anybody in our staff that is yet not to be called a racist over time. Jesus, in the pursuit of his calling, was accused of being the very opposite that he was, right? They accused him of being the son of Satan as opposed to the son of God. That's just what happens in, when you're dealing in high needs. And I said, so what are you going to say the first time somebody says to you, you ain't no pastor, you're actually a racist? And he goes, I'll just say, of course I'm a recovering racist just like all of us are. You know, because you look at what God has done and the fact that this is part of our flesh and our sin nature to pump ourselves up higher than somebody else, to self-assign us with authority that we don't have, to, self, to give us some kind of self-aggrandizement importance that we don't really have. That's just a part of our flesh that has to constantly be put to death by the cross and the power of Christ. And it's a lot like my, you know, my type 2 diabetes. I'm not really type 2 diabetic anymore, but I tell you, all it's going to take for me is about a good solid week of eating fast food, and that thing will rear its ugly head. And so you could say I'm a type 2 recovering diabetic, but we're all recovering racist to some degree. And the moment we let our flesh rise up, whether it be through hating the haters or condemning the condemners or thinking that somehow we've got to go repay and exact revenge physically with physical violence or whatever, the minute we do that, it's just a close cousin to racism itself when we hate the haters. I mean, look at what Paul says. Look at verse 9. This is where it's like, let your love be genuine. You know what that means? Let it be without hypocrisy. Let it be from within and who Christ is. Let it show itself. Look at what it says. Abhor what is evil. See, this is where this is where we can separate us from the world. We can all agree. We hate this stuff. It's evil. The Old Testament is full. The beginning of it says the, the, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. We should hate that stuff. Did you know where we need to start hating it the most? Is from within our own lives. I mean, if we somehow think that our evil is less than somebody else's evil, 
That's like, you know, the speck versus the log in the eye. And what God really wants us to do is hate evil, but let us start from within ourselves first. Why? Because he expects us, look what it says, hold fast what is good, love one another with brotherly affection. This is all inside the church. Outdo one another in honor. Don't be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Verse 12, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Do you think that's what we did this morning for the demazas? Contribute to the needs of the saints. Show hospitality. But look at what it says in verse 14, because this is where he starts talking about now outside the church. This is what you need to do. Bless those who persecute you. Now, that, this is where you can separate yourself from the world, Right? Because ain't nobody blessing the people that are persecuting us outside the church. It's all heaping more and more evil with evil. And he, he addresses that. Look at the verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Show that first slide, Trace. Remember this. Light and darkness are not opposing forces. Do you understand that? It's a physical reality. Darkness is simply the absence of light. Evil is simply the absence of love. And so no matter how big the light is, it can never be overcome by the darkness. You don't make a room dark by turning on the darkness, right? The only way you make a room dark is you turn off the light. So you want to see some evil being overcome by evil? There ain't nothing Jesus involved in that. It's all dark on dark. Darkness on darkness. Hate on hate. That's completely not who Christ is. And what he's telling us is, look, inject yourself. Inject who I am in the middle of this so that who I am can overcome the darkness around it. What does that mean? Does that mean you have to go throw flowers on the people in the parks in Charlottesville or whatever? No. But what it could very well mean is if you know a racist, you know somebody who hates people because of the color of their skin, don't run away from them. Find a way to engage and begin showing that maybe there's another possibility out there that could change their worldview so that one day they could possibly stand here and go, you know, I used to hate those people, but then Christ. That's what Christ desires out of us. Don't overcome evil with evil. Counteract and inject Christ into it. Now, this is why I'm so passionate about this. This is the bottom line right here. This is why I want to convince every person visiting that you being here is more than just you visiting a place of worship. You could very well play an important part in what God has asked us to do. You know, Mark had his clarion call back when he was talking about planting this church. And remember the story with Precious the barber? For those of you that don't, he was at a barber, and he was asking this, this lady named Precious if she thought a church like Mosaic could even exist here in Little Rock. And he said he was kind of going off and just thinking, and all of a sudden she just like snapped him out of this reverie and and he said it was like a shock running through his mind when she goes why couldn't a church like that be here mark and it was so like injecting into who he was he was like that was his moment of a clarion call and it was a very very good and important call mine really i say come came about eight years later in 2010, and it's while we were at a conference, the first conference that Mark held nationally out in California, 
and there was a professor there, and he was showing his presentation on the largest church study ever been done on the American church. 300,000 churches were studied in this research project, and he was presenting his findings. And the first couple of slides were all about how the church growth is lagging behind population growth. But then he showed this slide, and this rocks my world. He showed that the church in America, its growth was dependent on the median household income surrounding it. And if though, and by the way, remember, this is 2010 numbers, 2009 numbers, and that the most affluent sections of America had the fastest growing churches. Go figure. Very healthy, almost 20% growth. But as you went down in median household income, the growth slowed, and then look what happens when it hit $50,000, it starts shrinking, it starts having negative growth, and then the further you go off to the left, under $30,000 is definitely shrinking. And he said, so, what do you think the long-term trend for the church in America is if this continues? And I knew immediately, I was sitting there looking at that last number, because that's where we are, 72204. Back in those days, median household income was like $29,000, and today it's like $30,000. It's, it's like it's grown very little, if any. And when he said that, he just kind of let that question hang over all these pastors in the room. And I immediately went in my mind's eye to a map of America and my favorite verse, which says, the kingdom of heaven is like a fish net that catches fish of every kind. And I pictured this net over America that had big holes in it over the most needy sections of the country, and especially our own zip code. And I remember in that moment thinking, I have to do everything in my power, everything according to my calling, to strengthen the knot of the net over 72204. That was 2010. Mark was just as struck by that. And that was the beginning of the development of the third leg that he talks about in the book Disruption where we go spiritual, social, economic, we realize that churches in these very difficult urban communities needed to have some kind of strategy that was based on the realities of church finances where they couldn't just survive, but they should thrive. And that's where we started working towards. Now, church of all people is a mandatory requirement in order to strengthen that knot. You know why? Because we need everybody. We need the people that are willing to drive in from the suburbs. We need people who can give. We also need the homeless people off the street that come in. Why? Because the more we are diverse, and able to show the world that Christ is able to overcome these barriers, the more the world is gonna go, man, there's something really special going on at that place. Now, I really believe that the multi-ethnic church is the cornerstone of that vision, that the more we toiled and struggled and worked together, the more I'm seeing it's not just about the church. This is a way by which churches in the inner city can be restored, renewed, have impact, and ultimately it's about overcoming repairing the damage from the most systemic racism and the most 
horrible victim of it our inner cities and so if we as a people could come together in such a way to begin showing the world that there's hope for this begin counteracting all these effects of all this systemic stuff that's happened over the years that is divided and separated divided and separated and segregated to the point of where there's whole sections of the city written off if we could make those areas relevant and life-giving I was telling the first service I would feel like my life was given to something worth giving and I don't know why I get so emotional over it but it's like if this could actually be the purpose for me being here every sacrifice along the way would have been worth it and so we're inviting you to come along because we need you we need every single one of you there's not a single person in this room that we don't need to accomplish this and if you don't believe me just read through the second uh, the third the second paragraph when you get a chance because it's all about how different we are and how gifted we are in different ways and how we need us all operating together as one body in order to accomplish this mission so you're invited just pray and ask the God to lead you I'm convinced he will call whom he desires it has very little to do with who you are what you think you had to offer has everything to do with the story that he wrote before the first light ever hit the darkness and it will be a pure calling that you don't know why you need to join us other than you feel like God is asking you to so we're 15 years old I feel like we're just getting started and for everything that the world throws that tries to convince us that it's an impossible solution I'm feeling like we're just gonna get started in terms of providing an answer that's real incredible and that lives lifts our Lord up so high that the rest of the world cannot deny his existence and his power amen let's pray together Lord you already know who was called to help us you've already drawn so many in to join us and I'm so grateful for that humbled beyond belief that you would organize this group of believers who are so gifted in so many ways so faithful in every way possible so passionate about your kingdom I pray you would let that passion burn brighter and brighter and brighter use us Lord the world is looking for answers would you please lift up yourself so that the world would see it and know that you indeed were sent by God for this very reason Lord keep us on our mission show us how to love the unbeliever Keep us consistent with who Christ is within us. Let us hate evil, but love those who persecute us. Love on those that show evil in return. Protect us, strengthen us, empower us to forgive each other, forgive anybody that does us harm. And we thank you, Lord. We love you. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.